My name is Val Swisher, and I am here to talk about natural language processing, cognitive systems, AI. We'll toss in a little bit of chatbot here and there. But let's start with this. How many of us ever do this anymore? Very few of us do. You, you, that's because you like it. I, if, if I did this in, in my husband's car or my son's car, there would be nothing for me to do, right? Everything's, we don't do this anymore. This is, you know, we, we really don't. Soon, nobody will know how to drive a stick other than the diehards. It's really hard to find a standard transmission car to buy. It really is, because our cars do this for us. We don't have to ship the car. In fact, we don't even need to know how to park anymore. His magic powers, Merlin made a spot. And this is a shame because I was born and raised in New York City, and I parallel park really well. It's like the one thing I do really well, and I don't have to do it anymore, because I just kind of drive up and I push a button and my car parks itself. So we need to do this either. In fact, I have a Tesla, and I don't even have to drive anymore. I don't need to know anything. I just like push the button, and it does, except when there's a software upgrade. When there's a software upgrade, all of a sudden my car's like a ping pong ball in the lane. But other than that, Car stays in the lane better than I stay in the lane. These are all things that we just don't do anymore or we're not going to have to do. And we could probably come up with a big, huge list of these kinds of things. And that's obviously because automation is everywhere. And I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. So let's take a look at some of the really cool things that are out there today. So this is Microsoft Cognitive Services. And I went and I uploaded my headshot. And as Marsha mentioned, I like to quilt. And I thought this was pretty interesting when I uploaded it because it says that I am 0.99999. I'm five nines happy. And I'm just a teeny bit disgusted. Just a teeny bit disgusted. I thought that was pretty interesting that it could just tell from this that I was really happy, but somehow that little look of disgust, maybe it was like, in my eye or something. I don't know. I like this one even better because it made me younger than I am, and I was all for this. So somehow it looked at me and said, I am 47.4. It knows that I'm female and I'm smiling. Let's remember, I just a teeny bit of disgust. Just a teeny bit. It knows that I'm wearing glasses. So it knows a whole bunch of stuff about me. All I did was upload a photo of me. And then there's this one. This one my son loves because it says that he's 32 and he was 18 when this picture was taken. So he was like, oh, this is the best application ever. I am all for Microsoft Cognitive Services Emotion API, but let's look at all the things it figured out. First of all, it knows that this is music. Very high confidence that this is music. It even knows that this is a brass instrument. Pretty good, huh? Right? Person, man, the fact that you know we got some beards probably helped. It's indoor. And this is the one that I, I really don't understand much. It says it's a concert band. And it's pretty darn sure it's a concert band. Does anyone know what instrument that is? Anyone know? Except Marsha, because you know. Hmm? Close. Very close. This is called a euphonium. A euphonium. My son's majoring in euphonium, so I'm going to work for the rest of my life. I will never retire. <laughs> my other son is an artist. I am so screwed. The euphonium is a beautiful instrument. It's, it's like the cello of the brass family. So it's, it's a little a higher pitched than a tuba. Almost the same as a baritone, a little bit lower pitch. But the thing about the euphonium, the reason I'm droning on and on about this, is that the euphonium was invented after most composers were already dead. There's nothing uh, orchestral. There's no orchestral music for euphonium. I'm telling you, I'm working for the rest of my life. I'm like, why are you playing it if you can't even be in an orchestra? The only type of band that has a euphonium is a concert band. I was like, did Microsoft really know that this is a euphonium and that there are no euphoniums in orchestras, so it has to be a concert band? 
I don't know the answer to this question, but I found that just completely mind-boggling, and my son just loved the fact that, you know, he's, Mom, I'm not going to get carded next time I go out. Anyway. So today what I really want to talk about are big cognitive systems, big, big, big cognitive systems, and the kinds of things that they allow us to do, and then how they do it. What's the magic? What's the magic inside a cognitive system? Because I was super curious about this. So these are just a few, right? We've got Microsoft at the top. We have Google DeepMind. That's a big one. Uh, Baidu has Minwa, that's in China, and of course, the mother of all, or father of all cognitive systems, which is IBM Watson. And I'm going to be talking a lot about Watson, because Watson has a lot of information out there. So I was able to get a lot of information, and now I know a lot of people at IBM Watson, because I run around talking about them, so they like me. Okay, so let's just start by where do we see these systems? Well. These systems, we're seeing them in lots and lots of places, definitely medical, right? There's a big oncology, uh, Watson Oncology project, right? And, and it's pretty cool, right? Because we figure right now we have people that talk to people and try to diagnose and come up with uh, possible action plans for people that are, are ill. And if you can use a cognitive system that has instantaneous access to a huge amount of information, Theoretically, we should come up with more, better diagnoses or treatment plans. And there's finance, there's all kinds of things. In the IBM world, there's no such thing as IBM Watson. It's IBM Watson Health, IBM Watson Money. So it's, it's, they've focused it on different verticals. And in the high-tech vertical, it's called IBM Watson Cognitive Services. I'm not quite sure why but that's what it's called. But finance, cooking, so you know what I want? This, I, what I, this is what I want. I want to be able to take my phone, I want to open my refrigerator, I want to point my phone, and I want it to scan and see everything that's in my refrigerator and then open my cupboard, and then I want it to send me right there the ingredients for dinner tonight. That's what I want. We'll get there, but why can't I do that? That's what I want. I, just, just tell me. There used to be a TV show. I'm old. There used to be this TV show where this guy would come unannounced and he'd like walk into your kitchen and he was a gourmet cook and he'd just like make a meal. Does anyone remember that? That's what I want. Travel. I want the travel system to know me so well that it picks the hotel, the beach, it gets the airfare and has a Mai Tai waiting for me when I get there. Like some nice person with a lay is going to hand it to me. And of course, the real reason we have Watson, is so that it can beat the pants off of a human being at Jeopardy. Right? In 2012, IBM Watson just annihilated the humans. And I'm going to explain to you how it was able to do this, because once you understand how it works, you're going to go, well, of course, we didn't stand a chance against this machine. There was no way. We're going to talk about that. So at the base of pretty much all of these systems, there's an understanding of the meaning and intent of content. This is how they all work. They work by understanding not just the content, but the intent of the content, the meaning and the intent of content. This is, this is it. This is where they all start from. So what we have done for years, what I have done my entire career, is the key to making AI work. And if you had told me 30 years ago or 24 years ago when I started my company that not only would my company continue for 24 years, but somehow we would end up on the leading edge of technology in content, I don't think I would have believed you. Because it's just content. It's just content. It's, it's, it's just words and pictures. But what we have been doing as content creators, whether it's marketing content, technical content, whatever kind of content, that's the key. That's what AI does. That's how a cognitive system works. So let's look at this. So here's, uh, this is a little video from IBM Watson. You can go out on YouTube. They've got lots of videos. So here is a sentence that IBM Watson needs to parse, needs to understand this. So the sentence is, 
fly over the boat with the red bow or bow. What does this mean? It can mean a lot of things. It could mean that fly, there's a noun, there's a fly, a fly that's over the boat, and the boat has a little red bow on it. It could mean that. It could mean I'm flying over the boat that has a red bow. And if you watch the video more, there was a bow and arrow. I'm flying over the boat that has a red bow, a bow and arrow. So the challenge for all of these systems is to parse this sentence and understand what the heck it means. What is the meaning and intent of this system? How does it do this? Well, the guts, the internal, the heart of a cognitive system is a natural language processor, an NLP, sophisticated natural language processor. We need that so that it can understand the meaning and intent of content. So what's the magic of an NLP? How does an NLP work? Think of your content as a basket of bread. And each loaf of content is a sentence. Okay, pretty much. An NLP looks at each sentence and starts to parse it and can even figure out if you've made mistakes, right? You have the wrong part of speech, you have some type of error. It can figure out when you have things like etc. In fact, if you think of the basket of bread as your content and each loaf is your sentence, well, each word or phrase is a slice of that loaf of bread. So in this particular example, the NLP knows, for example, that .zip is a file extension. And it knows that there's a bunch of lowercase words. It's got some words in there. It knows that New Zealand is a place, and it knows that it's not New and Zealand. It knows it's New Zealand, and that's a place. It knows this. It knows you've got a Latin expression, ad hoc, etc., whatever. And it knows you have a unit of measure. It knows that you have a false stop at the end. It would know if you were missing your full stop. It would know if it was a question mark or an exclamation mark. It would know all these things. So a natural language processor works by looking at each and every sentence and figuring out all the different parts of speech so that it can understand the meaning and intent of that sentence. That's at the heart of all of this. Every, everything that comes on top of a natural language processor being able to parse a sentence like this one. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so now we understand the, the insides. So how does a cognitive system work? I mean, how, do, how, does, how does something like IBM Watson work? How do I, how do I play with this? I wanna play with this system more than just uploading my picture and having it tell me I'm 47. There's four things that we have to do, four stages to making a cognitive system like Watson work. And I'm gonna talk about each one of these. Upload, curate, ingest, and train. And remember, at the heart is the NLP, understanding the meaning and intent of every sentence that you put into it. All right, so the very first thing that we have to do when we want to deploy a cognitive system is we have to upload as much content as we can possibly get our hands on in the domain in which we want the system to operate. And I mean a lot of content. I mean everything. I mean your entire corpus. Does anyone know what they uploaded to Watson when Watson won at Jeopardy? Anybody know? No? Yeah, who said, yeah, they uploaded, yay! Give that man a prize. They uploaded all of Wikipedia, the whole thing. 
Now, Wikipedia doesn't always have correct information, but for Jeopardy, it's going to have correct information. So imagine that you had all of Wikipedia in your brain. We didn't stand a chance. It wasn't going to happen that we could not possibly win. We didn't have access to that much content in that short amount of time. So the first thing you're going to do is take everything, everything you can get your hands on, and upload it. OK? Well, once you do that, you realize that, gee whiz, there's a lot of garbage out there in all of my content. We all suffer from content garbage. So the next thing you have to do is curate the content, which means you got to throw out the stuff that's either incorrect, outdated, for whatever reason, it's not good. And a machine cannot do this. Only a person or people who understand that domain can do this. You need to have oncologists who are curating the corpus of oncology information. You certainly don't want me doing that. This takes a long time. This is not simple. Standing up one of these systems is not simple. But first, you find all the content you can, and second, you curate it. Can you do it in the other du direction? Can you curate it first and then upload it? You can. But what you'll see later is that there's a good reason not to, and that all has to do with statistics and how content is accessed. Okay. You'll see that. The Eventually, the correct answers rise to the top, statistically. But you can do the best you can. You're going to go out there, and you are going to scrub your content. After it's uh, curated, then the system itself does a process called ingestion, which I love because it's so human. You just kind of, you know, you think it's, and then you think it's digesting, right, it's visual. When it ingests the content, the system itself actually goes in and applies its own metadata. All that work we've been doing on taxonomies, I'm, I'm in a very heated discussion right now with the CCMS vendor where I am saying cognitive systems are going to have their own taxonomies. It's going to understand the meaning and intent. It's going to understand who's looking at it. It's going to create it on its own. And they're saying, oh, no, we need taxonomies because we have to sell more CCMS systems. <laughs> we'll see. But it does create its own internal taxonomy that allows it to get access to all that information very quickly, more quickly than anything we would come up with. So that's all internal. Okay? And it's not something that we would use as humans. It's all internally done, ingested by the system. And finally, once we've done all of this, we now get to train the engine. This is a lot of work. This is not for the meek and timid. It's amazing, but it's a lot of work. Our jobs aren't going away anytime too soon, because there's a lot of work to be done. So once, it's once you got the corpus uploaded, and you've curated it, and it's ingested it. Now we have to go in and we have to train the system. And how do we do that? We do that using something called the ground truth. Okay. Now you, you probably saw on this slide before, this is called machine learning. We'll talk a bit more about machine learning. But we start with something called the ground truth, because we have all this content in the system and now we have to teach it the linguistics. This is the part that blew my mind. You see, we're not teaching Watson about oncology or about stocks and bonds or about the Mai Tai that I want in Hawaii. We're teaching it how to understand the linguistics of the domain. How do we speak about oncology? Because we speak about oncology using different words than we speak about my Mai Tai. One can only hope. So that's what we're doing here. We're really teaching it the linguistics, because that's all it can understand. It's not like somehow it became a doctor. 
It understands, it's got this huge corpus and it understands linguistics. And when we query it, it's got this internal metadata. So it parses the query, it applies its internal metadata and poof, it finds your answer or two or three or 20 or 300. I, maybe it's lunchtime after. This blew my mind. People, this should blow your mind. This blew my mind. It's all linguistics. It's, 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 it's all Marsha's book. It's verbs and nouns and all those things. Everybody has Marsha's book, right? You should. <laughs> so, a ground truth is a question and answer pair. And that's how we teach the engine. By feeding it question and answer pairs. Now, most of the customers that I'm working with that are planning for a cognitive system, and a few who are um, bold enough to actually start working with cognitive systems, they all tend to be starting with support content. Big surprise. It's question and answer pairs. Big surprise. Right? So if you want to get a jump start, start working on your question and answer pairs. That's a good place to start, because you're going to need them to train the engine. And once the engine understands the linguistics, it can then go into the corpus and start figuring out all kinds of other stuff. All kinds of other stuff. Now, there's two kinds of content for a cognitive system. There's structured content. Those are the question and answer pairs that I used to train the system. This is not structured DITA, XML, blah. none of those acronyms. This is question and answer pairs in a structure. That's question and answer. That's structured content. Then there's everything else. And everything else is dark content. And for us today, we don't have access to that dark content. Think of all the content that you have at your company that you just don't have access to. It's not like you, you, you can't really search for it. There's, there's tweets. Oh, there's tweets. And there's other social media. There's Slack channels. There's PDF, which I have been quoted, and you can quote me, is PDF is the graveyard of all content. PDF is the graveyard. It is dark content. Ever try searching in a PDF if you weren't in the PDF? Okay, But a cognitive system can because it understands the linguistics of your domain. And it's going to go into all that dark content, understanding the meaning and the intent of the linguistics, and it's going to find all kinds of information and answers that we didn't have available to us before because it wasn't in a format that we could get to before. A cognitive system doesn't care. You have to train it with a question and answer pair, a lot of them. A lot of them, hundreds, thousands of question and answer pairs. But then it can go find stuff in places that we never thought it would find stuff. All the dark content becomes available to it. So let's talk a little bit about chatbots, because I think that people are very confused right now about AI and chatbots. A chatbot is not a cognitive system. A chatbot is a front end to a something. What's behind the chatbot could be a cognitive system. Seems like a good use. It could be some other type of CMS. Good use. It could be a whole bunch of flat files. It could be a whole bunch of different things. A chatbot needs to understand your meaning and intent. So it still needs natural language processing. But it is not a cognitive system. It is a front end to your information. Because people are deploying chatbots all the time. And you're all sticking around for Nas. He's going to tell you all about that. I promised you I'd warm them up for you. He's going to tell you all about that. But that's not Watson. That's a front end. You could do that today. And you could front end your web CMS if you want to. You could front end a CCMS if you got tech content. You could front end them all in the same interface. You could do that. You could do that. So this is um, 
Microsoft support, and I know the guy who's responsible for this project, and I called him up, and I said, okay, I want to snap a slide for my presentation, and uh, show me something that's going to work and is going to work. <laughs> show me something that's going to work. And he said, okay, go out online and say, I can't connect to Xbox Live. I said, okay, I kind of know what that means, I think. So I went out. And uh, one thing that was funny was that this has changed. It's probably changed again. I didn't get to look at it right before this conference. But this has changed several times since I've been doing this presentation. And each time, I have to redo it. And it says, hi, I'm Microsoft's new virtual support agent. You, know, you, can, you can talk to me. You can talk to somebody else. And I say, I can't connect to, connect to Xbox Live. And she says, here's what I think you're asking about. An Xbox Live account subscription issue, is that correct? And if I really couldn't connect to Xbox Live at this point, I would probably have picked up my phone. Because we have a whole new series of challenges with chatbots, such as you should understand my meaning and intent even if I haven't told you. Otherwise, I'm going to be frustrated. I don't want you to check in with me now when we go out and we have a chatbot, a lot of the time, I'm not going to say always, but a lot of the time, we put in what we're thinking in whatever words we use, which may or may not be real sentences, may or may not be formulated correctly. And the first thing that the chatbot has to do is it has to say, is this what you mean? I think this is what you mean. Oh, that's not what you mean? Let me take another guess. How about this? Is this what you mean? So one of the things that I have been thinking and saying lately is that people like me who got their degrees in social psychology, my degrees in social psychology and music, I wasn't destined for anything either. Maybe there's hope for my kids. We're going to need all these psychology people to understand, is this what you mean? Tell me more about what you mean. A chatbot really needs to reach out to you and say, tell me how you feel about it. Tell me more about what you mean. It's a big challenge with chatbots. And as content creators, now we really need to understand how people are going to say things. Because they're not even going to say things in full sentences. And they're going to get frustrated if we ask them for clarification. It's a whole other level of interface. But there is a natural language processor in here. And it did parse the sentence, I can't connect to Xbox Live. And it did go back into its corpus using whatever metadata it had. And it did come up with, hmm, I think you're asking about a subscription issue. But maybe the thing isn't plugged in. I mean, there's all kinds of reasons I couldn't connect to Xbox Live. Maybe it's broken. I don't know. Maybe my mother pulled the plug out of the wall and threw it away. But a chatbot is not a cognitive system. It has an NLP, cognitive system has an NLP, but that's where, that's where the similarity ends. Okay. All right, so has this work again? All right, so now I've, cur I've uploaded all this stuff and I've curated it and it's ingested it and I've trained it and half my life has gone by and now that it has all this information now how does it work? Well, let's say I type in a query. The first thing a cognitive system does is it figures out all the parts of speech and the NLP gets to work parsing your sentence. The better the sentences we write, the better chance we have that this thing's going to come back with an answer that makes sense to us. And it's going to generate a hypothesis based on its understanding of the linguistics. And then it's going to go out and locate evidence. That's what it thinks is the answer. Because it's got this whole corpus. It's trained. It's brilliant. It's smart. And it's going to score it. It's going to score it estimating the confidence level. Here's three answers. I think this one is the best. In fact, I have a 55% a confidence, statistical confidence, that this one is the best. How does it get that? It gets that because the machine learning keeps going. 
it's always learning. It's always learning more. It's always learning more about linguistics, and it's always learning more by people saying that's the right answer. Have you ever noticed in Google Translate, if it's not right, you can actually say, no, that's wrong. I'm going to put in a, a, an even worse translation for you. As these engines are learning, the experts can score and can put in new information. And so over time, the answers that were incorrect start floating to the bottom, and it, they, don't, they don't come up with statistical significance as answers to queries. Okay, So how does this look? All right, so if you go out on um, Bluemix, you can get an account. That's the IBM Watson platform. And IBM has about three bazillion APIs for Watson. It just, it just wants you to connect everything, everything. All IBM wants is your corpus. It's all it ever asked for. We thought Google wanted our corpus. No, 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 no. IBM wants our corpus. And I'm not getting into the ethics of any of that, particularly today. <laughs> But you can go in, you can make yourself an account, and then you can play around with Watson like I did. And I went into this thing called Retrieve and Rank. It's just one of the little apps. It has an API, and you can use it. And this particular one, the, do the, the corpus, the domain, is about the Cranford collection, which is all about aerodynamics, which I know absolutely nothing about. Okay. I'm sitting on the plane, it's a southwest plane, I have a window seat, and I see a guy walking up the ladder with duct tape. This is a true story. And he put duct tape on the wing of the plane. And we took off. And the duct tape was gone by the time we landed, and I was like freaking out. That's my experience with aerodynamics, and that is a true story, and I have photos to prove it. But in this case, thank goodness it actually generates the question too. And it generated this question, what is the best theoretical method for calculating pressure on the surface of a wing alone? And what does that have to do with duct tape? And then it went off and it found answers in the corpus. And it did two different kinds of answers. The top was the Watson answers, the machine learning approach. And it said, you know, I'm 50% sure it's this answer on the bottom. Zero, I found this, I don't think so. Elliptical cones, maybe. And if I was an expert duct taper, I could say, yes, this is the one. It also went out to the web and did a standard search and found a couple of things. And of course, it doesn't do statistical uh, significance based on web searches. It only can do it based on the corpus that it has access to and knows and understands. So this is called Retrieve and Rank. It's kind of fun to play with. There's a lot of things that are fun to play with out there if, if you have free time and want to play with them. But it makes sense. It makes sense. And that's how it works. So to recap, the machine learns linguistic patterns of a domain. That's how it works. And it processes enormous amounts of data at incredible speeds. It also can identify additional possibilities from that huge corpus in dark content as well, which is new for us. And it can apply statistical significance to the data because the people keep helping it. And it continues to learn through the interaction. Machines are great at that. What do I do? Well, I have to provide the domain expertise so that I can curate the content. That is a big job. And I provide the ground truth to train it. And I'm telling you, Watson will never beat me in hummus because I make a mean hummus like nobody's business. I mean, really, parallel parking and hummus, those are my things. Takeaways for today. Artificial intelligence is based on natural language processing. That means that they parse sentences to understand the meaning and intent of content and make decisions based on the meaning and intent of content. It's important 
your brand is important, the quality of your content becomes extremely important, you need to make sure that your content makes sense so that it can learn the appropriate linguistics of your domain. Garbage in, garbage out. So I'm Val Swisher, as we said, I wrote a book, Global Content Strategy. I have a basic belief that content should be easy to read, efficient to create, and cost-effective to translate. Those are my three things. I founded my company in 1994. We have worked with hundreds of companies on thousands of projects. We are the North American service provider for Acrolinks, the sponsor of this, con of this conference. And it just so happens that Acrolinks is a natural language processor that understands the meaning and intent of your content. We have four services. You can see them on my website. We do strategy. We do optimization. We develop lots of content here and everywhere. Here's a few of our customers in the 250. And that's all I got. <laughs>